Thanks everyone for being here. I was uh, also a little bit concerned about our 4.15 start time, and but thankfully it's super rainy outside and there's <laughs> nothing you can do but be in here. So thanks for coming. <laughs> So you're, you're here uh, to hear about the, I think we've called this the union gravy train. But we, uh, this morning actually, Jason Bedrick here and I, were talking a little bit about the excellent series over at Redefined that they've written. If you ever want to uh, read a great education website, go to Redefined and, and read their blog post. But there's a great series there that they're doing called The Voucher Left, right? So dispelling this notion that the idea of school choice is solely the domain of the right that for a long time, um, folks on the left were very much in favor of advancing school choice. And just to put a finer point on it, um, if you look over at Redefined and read some of their posts, Doug Tuttle has a, a great series that outlines the platforms of the Democratic Party over the past few decades. So if you go back to the 70s, the 1972 platform talked about supporting, allocating financial aid by a constitutional formula to children in non-public schools. The 1976 platform endorsed parental freedom in choosing the best education for their children. Even though the 1976 platform endorsed parental choice in education, at the same time, something else was happening. So we can't say it was entirely a voucher left. That same year, 1976, the NEA endor endorsed Jimmy Carter for president. And as Doug Tuttle points out over at Redefine, the first, it was the first presidential endorsement in the NEA's history. And the NEA not only asked Carter to create a, a federal education department, which we're all pretty familiar with, and which, by the way, a few years later, when Reagan came in, would deem Carter's bureaucratic boondoggle, very famously, but they not only asked President Carter to establish a cabinet-level agency for education, but they asked him to uh, basically put a damper on this support among the left for private school choice. But despite the NEA's efforts, the party continued to support the concept of school choice in subsequent platforms, thanks to the likes of individuals such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan and entities such as the Catholic Church. Their 1980 platform read, quote, private schools, particularly parochial schools, are an important part of our country's educational system. The platform supported a constitutionally acceptable method of providing tax aid to education of all pupils, e.g. tax credits, to advance school choice. And the 1984 platform again endorsed the idea of funding for private schools, particularly parochial schools. But as Tuttle points out, union power had been waxing. And by 1992, this shift had begun. The party platform read, we oppose the Bush administration's efforts to bankrupt the public school system, the bedrock of democracy through private school vouchers. So we see a shift happening. Exit, the voucher left. And more recently, we've heard comments from union heads, which let me say, should of course be considered distinct from teachers, the teachers that they purport to represent, due to the effect, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, unions had saying, of course, you've heard this many times, that they would start representing the interest of children when children started paying union dues. So we all know that unions have been a big part of maintaining the public education bureaucracy. So if you look at from about 1970 to today, 1970 to 2012, we have seen an incredibly modest increase in student enrollment in public schools across the country, about an 8% increase from 1970 through 2012. If you look at the number of teaching staff over the same time period, we've seen a 60% increase in the number of teaching staff. So total enrollment among staff has gone up about 84%, but when you dig into the numbers, you'll notice that non-teaching staff is the biggest increase. There has been a 138% increase in non-teaching staff over that same time period from 1970 through 2012. Remember, 8% increase in student enrollment, 138% increase in non-teaching staff. And Matthew Ladner pointed this out this morning as well in his panel. The other way to think about that if you go back to 1950, there were 2.36 teachers for every non-teacher in a school district. Today it's one to one. So for every teacher you see in a district, there is a non-teaching counterpart in that district. And so of course, this is something that the unions love. 
right? More dues paying members. But what do we get for all of this bureaucracy? We certainly don't get or haven't seen improvements in educational outcomes over the decades, but here's one example of what we get. Uh, this uh, was in the news about three weeks ago. Two elementary schools in Minneapolis have now hired recess consultants. Recess consultants as part of a new strategy. Kids are now coached to play during recess, right? You've heard of the PC police, we now have the PE police. But beyond that, thank you, beyond that, <laughs> <laughs> unions have big, been some of the biggest blockers of reforms that could truly be transformational. We have heard so much today about the transformational power of things like education savings accounts. Unlike the voucher left of the 60s and 70s, unions today vehemently oppose school choice, but also reforms that could mean flexibility in personnel decisions, flexibility in pay for teachers and alternative teacher certification. Current laws also insulate and protect teachers' unions. They protect unions from annual elections. Policies prevent teachers from leaving the union, except within a very narrow window. The automatic withdrawal from teachers' paychecks to pay for union dues. These are laws that protect a bygone era, and they are incompatible with an increasing, increasingly market-based and student-centered education environment. So we have a great panel today to hash out some of these issues and talk through them, and we're very excited to take your questions as well. We all agreed that Q&A is much more interesting than us just standing up here and talking, so we will definitely have ample time for that. But you can all read bios, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but just to, to quickly point out who we have, Jeannie Allen, President Emeritus of the Center for Education Reform, to my right. And to her left, we have Representative Ross Spano of Florida. Uh, on the end here, we have Representative Grant Hodges from Arkansas, and I should add, you should trust everything he says implicitly because he is former heritage. <laughs> and, Former Representative Jay Love, who is now at the Business Education Alliance of Alabama. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. We didn't draw straws for who's gonna go first, so. I think we're sticking in the order. I think I was told I was going first, so I'll, I'll stick my neck out. Well, my name is Grant Hodges, and I want to thank you all for having me on this panel today. I'm excited to be here. I do not have a PowerPoint uh, for you today, but after the lunch speaker, I'm a little bit relieved that I don't. Um, I'm just going to stick with my trusty piece of paper. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, the uh, situation that I encountered when I got elected uh, this last year in Arkansas, um, the Arkansas Education Association, and kind of how our system was set up and the bill that we passed during our legislative session. Uh, the bill that I introduced was House Bill 1957, and I'm gonna read you the title of it, which was to determine a time frame for a public school employee to opt in or opt out of membership in a labor organization. Um, so it, it sounds simple. I mean, that's literally all it did was allow you to opt in or opt out of union membership whenever you wanted. Um, simple but kind of profound when you realize uh, the system that they had kind of set up in Arkansas with the teachers union. Um, the AEA, the Arkansas Education Association, uh, their dues are about $700 a year and they have about, they have said 13,000 members. Um, so when you add it up, it's about over $9 million a year. Um, and in our state, you know, where your average legislative race typically costs less than $50,000, it's a pretty significant force in Arkansas politics. Um, and their dues are deducted automatically from teachers' paychecks. Uh, so the system that they created to keep the teachers in the unions uh, was pretty creative. Uh, they would give you a one-month window every year to opt out of your union membership. So if you're a teacher, you go in, you sign up to be in the, the AEA, uh, you were in the union and you could not leave until they, once a year they would give you a one-month window to, to leave. And, uh, uh, when, if you decided to leave, you know, sometimes people might get sick or things would get lost in the mail. Um, you know, you never really know what you're going to run into if uh, someone decides to leave. So sometimes they made it a little bit difficult. So essentially what they did was come up with a system that made an end run around, uh, you know, our right to work laws or, um, you know, giving people the choice of joining a union or not joining a union. 
Uh, it made it very difficult to leave once you got out. They kind of got their hooks in you. Uh, so I guess the question would be, why would you want to opt out? If someone did join um, a teacher's union, why would you choose to opt out? And uh, I had kind of an interesting experience. I talked to one of my uh, family members who had just started teaching uh, last year and asked her if she was a member. And she said, yes. And I asked why. And she said, well, I kind of thought I had to be. And uh, you know, I, I thought that was interesting. I asked her why. And she said, well, I thought I had to, I thought I had to sign up. That's kind of what it, the impression I got. And I thought I needed this liability protection, uh, things like that. And I said, well, other groups offer that kind of protection. You know, you don't have to join. It was, it was optional. Um, and that's kind of how the laws that we have in Arkansas. And I asked if she was aware that the AEA is a pretty political uh, organization, very active in politics and involved in politics, and uh, gave her an example of their endorsements from 2014, uh, which I looked up when I was uh, considering running this bill. And in 2014, the AEA had endorsed every Democrat candidate running uh, for statewide office in Arkansas from governor on down, every congressional candidate, uh, they endorsed the Democrat, and every state legislative race, they endorsed the Democrat candidate. There was one exception, which was the state land commissioner, uh, which they endorsed the Republican and the Democrat. Um, so, you know, points for bipartisanship there, I guess. Uh, and so I told my family member this, she was pretty surprised, and I think a lot of members might be surprised, they don't know when they're signing up that it can be a partisan political organization that you're in, even though you might not think that at, you know, at first glance. You might think you're just signing up for you know, teacher protection or you know, collective bargaining rights, even though we don't do much of that in Arkansas anyway. Um, and uh, so basically, you know, people can run into different reasons of why they might want to leave the union once they join it. This is just one example of maybe you join not realizing that you're joining a, a group whose, I, whose ideals and policies you might not agree with, and you might want the opportunity to leave. And previously in Arkansas, you know, if you consider this example of, say, my family member who comes in and, and, and joins the union in August, and then these endorsements roll out in October, um, you know, and they endorse all these candidates, and maybe you didn't realize that that was, you know, their position, and you decide you want to leave, you would have previously been stuck in the union until that window came along once a year. And because it's, your dues are deducted automatically, you can't stop your payments from going to the union. So, um, you know, that would $700 a year, about $60 a month, continues to go to an organization that you might not want to be in anymore. And so the bill we passed pretty simply says, if you want to join a union, if you want to join a, a teacher's union, that is fine, that is your prerogative, you have the right to do that. Uh, but it also says that if you do that, uh, you also have the right to leave at, at any point if you choose. You have the right to associate freely. Um, and uh, we passed that law, and it's, it's gone into effect now. The governor signed it, and uh, we'll probably get an idea uh, more next year, the end of, the, of this semester, maybe the uh, spring of next year, uh, how many people have taken advantage of that. But I do already know of a couple of examples of teachers who have joined the Arkansas Education Association and decided to take advantage of this law um, to opt out. So. One thing we did in Arkansas, I suspect that a few of your states have similar systems set up, and uh, if you're interested in uh, a law like this or a bill like this or um, a couple of ideas like this for your state, uh, I think it can be very helpful uh, for your teachers, your constituents, and your schools. Very good. We had, <clears throat> I'm from Alabama, and uh, we had a problem in the fact that the state was collecting the dues uh, for political organizations. The Alabama Education Association, which is the teachers' union, was one of them. The State Employees Association uh, was also one of them. And the ta challenge that we had in Alabama was the most politically powerful individual um, was the head of the teachers' union. And I found out through my, you know, my career in politics is that when people have a lot of power, they don't want to give it up. And he did not want to give it up. And he had been the most powerful individual for the better part of 40 years. So I'm giving you just a little bit of history so you can understand the context. In our state, we have um, a constitution that gives a tremendous amount of power to the legislature. The executive branch, local governments are fairly weak. They just about all have to come to the legislature to get any kind of movement on, on a change in the code or uh, whatever their issue might be. And with that, uh, the gentleman that ran the AEA understood that better than anybody. And so 
in our state, they had around 100,000 members, about 50,000 teachers and 50,000 support personnel. And they were collecting dues month after month, three and four hundred thousand dollars at a time per month. And in a, in a small state like Alabama, if you can collect seven, eight, nine million dollars over a quadrennium, that makes you a very powerful um, political organization. And when you have not only money, but you have constituents that you can reach out to, that makes you even that much more powerful. In our state, we don't have collective bargaining. So anytime there was a pay raise or a change in, or a potential change in tenure laws, insurance, retirement, fair dismissal, it had to go through the legislature. And he had his thumb on the legislature and could exercise really ultimate control. He was the man pu pulling the strings. Um, uh, around what would happen. If he was supportive of it, it would pass. If he was against it, it would fail. And so by not having a very strong executive branch, it really didn't really matter who your governor was uh, in terms of their personality or party they were in. It was very difficult. There was no budget constraints. I know in some states when the governor proposes a budget, the legislature can't act outside of that budget number. But in our state, the, the legislature could, could um, adopt any kind of budget they wanted to and uh, override a governor's veto by a simple majority of the body elected. So they were very, very powerful. But in 2010, there was the Republican sweep and Alabama participated that in that like no other state. We went from around 44 members in the House to 66 members in the House. We have 105, a total of 105 members. We went from 13 senators to 22 senators in, in uh, overnight. And in Alabama, the legislature takes office at 1201 the day after the election. <laughs> so we're, we're if you were elected legislator, you're immediately, uh, you take office. Uh, we had a governor, Governor Riley, that was elected in 2002. We have term limits for governors. There are no term limits for legislators. So a legislator can stay there for 20, 30 years as long as he keeps getting elected. And so uh, Governor Riley was a very reform-minded governor, was supportive of charter schools, was supportive of um, merit pay, was supportive of budget reform, trying to make sure that we had responsible budgets. But when the teacher, the union teachers had, had control, all those ideas were dead on arrival. So there was no way he could get, get, get any of that passed. Um, under a Democrat legislature. So as soon as 1201 hit the night of November the 6th, uh, 2010, it was a different day. And he realized that. He had two months left before he went out of office and the new governor would come in. So he called a special session for the first week of, uh, or the second week of, of December. And you have to understand as a Republican, and I had served for eight years in the minority, and there were a lot of members that had served longer than I had, there was a lot of pent-up demand for Republican ideas, you know, <laughs> bills that we could never, ever get passed or would be stolen. Um, and so we, we, we were ready to go. Um, they called us into special session for that second week of, of, of uh, December. There were, a lot of, there were several reform-minded bills, but the, uh, the one I'm going to talk about is Senate Bill 2, and that was the prohibition on, on uh, the state or any local municipality or County Board of Education from collecting dues um, for, or for any political organization. We passed that bill, it took a, we had like a 15 hour filibuster in, uh, in, in the House and passed it at two or three o'clock in the morning um, in early December and the governor signed it into law as soon as he got it. Well, the, the union didn't go down without a fight so they filed a lawsuit in federal court and it took, uh, and they got a favorable judge in the sense that he issued a temporary restraining or a temporary injunction against implementation that lasted three years. And so they were able to still con collect those dollars, but the handwriting was on the wall. Everybody knew eventually that uh, the um, Supreme Court would rule, we felt like we would rule in our favor, and they did. Um, and so that prohibited any union or political organization from, from um, having their dues collected. And so one of the questions was, was what was the impact on that particular organization in terms of their, their PAC collections? And I'll just give you, I don't have a full annual uh, report because I don't have to file again because of the delays for three years. 
uh, it went into effect in about June of 13. So from July 13 to December 13, they collected $1.3 million in PAC contributions to their PAC. From July to December of 14, they collected $796,000. So that was a drop of 40%. We'll know at the end of this next uh, reporting cycle in January what the total annual impact was. The gentleman that led the, uh, the Alabama Education Association retired um, in, in 2011, and the replacement, uh, you could write a book on him, um, he had big shoes. I mean, he was following a legend in terms of the, the, um, the, the political power that he had. Um, but he, over the course of about a year and a half, he spent all their reserves. He borrowed $5 million. Um, he got into some pretty creative investment that turned poorly. And in, in, anyway, they ended up spending almost $20 million in this last election cycle, which is a tremendous amount of money. Um, and had very little to show for it. And so the, the impact was they, the, the board came in and fired him and that the NEA has come in now to take over and is operating the Alabama Education Association. So they're a shell of what they were, but um, you know, we, we, it, it has been uh, a really interesting way to see how far, they, they, the, how the far the fall has been from 2010 to 2014. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ross Spano. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry for folks on this side that you can't see. Um, but I had the opportunity and, and the privilege to talk to you about a bill that um, I had the privilege to sponsor in the Florida House last year. And um, it relates to something called uh, teacher liability, uh, professional liability coverage. And so uh, I have a background as an attorney, so I, I, I know as an attorney it's important that I have professional liability coverage because um, I do something uh, and it doesn't take much sometimes for folks to think you did something wrong. And so uh, it's important to have that insurance. Um, and so teachers um, feel like that's important too. They're professionals and uh, I, I think they probably do have the, the right to have that, that coverage. So what, is, what has happened over the last uh, at least several years in Florida is uh, that um, we've come to find that many teachers, a very large percentage, and it's probably arguable as to how many, but 30 to 40% of the teachers that are members of the Education Association in the state of Florida, um, on polling, um, basically acknowledge that they join the union because they feel like they need that liability protection. And so, uh, you know, God bless you, you're a teacher and you wanna be a member of the union, fantastic. Um, but, but we as a, state, as a state felt like that uh, we had the responsibility to provide that coverage to teachers. And, uh, and so we took the steps to do that. Um, uh, we, uh, we were able to get it uh, passed. We had to ultimately get it passed in the budget um, and uh, because of some other, uh, as other members up here who served in the legislature, there were some other issues, contentious issues in the budget between the House and the Senate in Florida. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna file that bill again this year and we're gonna, I'm positive we're gonna get passed in the House and the Senate. But give you a little bit of the, the history and the, and the background uh, of the bill. Um, so you, know, you, might, you might think that um, uh, you're gonna get a lot of pushback you know, from the Democratic caucus and in, in some, some circles we did. But I gotta tell you, we, we passed every, we've passed every House committee unanimously. Um, and we passed on the floor overwhelmingly. Um, and um, as the bill moved through the Senate, if we had gotten it to the, to the to Senate floor, it probably would have passed unanimously or close to unanimously anyway. And here, here's how we did that. So you might be asking the question, well, you know, I'd like to maybe consider something like that in my state, um, but I'm really, really concerned about the, the, the pushback and the, 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 the possibly significantly contentious arguments that we're gonna have. And so how, how do you sell that? So how did you, how'd you make that work, Ross? How did you sell that? So here, here's what we did. We didn't really make it a battle with the union. Here was, here was the message. The message is every teacher in the state of Florida deserves professional liability coverage. If you wanna be a member of the union, God bless you, join the union. But that doesn't mean that the teachers who are not don't have the right to liability coverage. And so we made that argument and, um, and that's it made it very difficult for, for, for some of the members in the, um, on the other side of the aisle to oppose uh, that bill, at least openly. Maybe, maybe they were working behind the scenes, but, uh, but they couldn't oppose it openly. I mean, who, who doesn't think teachers should be protected? 
from, from lawsuits um, as part of uh, w what they do as a profession. So uh, <clears throat> I would suggest that if you, if, you, if you consider a bill like that, it's all about the messaging. And in many cases, as we all know, with any issue, it's, it's really about the messaging. And so the message, the message is that we're, the union is not necessarily the enemy. Um, we're not opposed to anything necessarily. We're for teachers. And uh, so here are some of the arguments that, that we got uh, uh, from some of the members on the other side, but then mostly from, from interest groups. Some of the arguments were um, we, we, we don't need it because um, unions and even some local school boards already provide. Uh, that coverage. And our response was, again, fantastic, but there are some folks that don't have it. Um, another argument was uh, it's, it's too expensive. Uh, there was a period of time actually in Florida where we had such coverage, uh, 2002 to 2005, I believe it was. And there was, there was a, a study done in the state of Florida um, that seemed to indicate that there were only a few claims that had been made. So the argument was, well, we don't need it. It's too expensive. Not many claims were made. Well, the, well, what we found out was that teachers didn't know about the coverage, <laughs> so um, they're not going to—they're uh, not going to uh, elect to be covered if they don't know about the coverage. And so, what we did with the bill was we made absolutely certain that teachers know about it. So, what we did was we required the local school boards in a notice each year. What we did—we did it on a small, or actually a large postcard, just like you would get from your insurance uh, provider every year. You may get a, a, a postcard in the mail that says you have insurance coverage and this is the extent of your coverage and uh, this is what you do if you need to file a claim. Uh, uh, this is what you do if you have questions. Here's the toll free number to call. And so that's what we did. We, we, we mandated that our school boards, and we, of course we funded, I mean, we didn't want to pr uh, mandate something that, that they were going to uh, argue they didn't have the ability to fund. So we provided the funding to do it, but, but we made it an, an imperative, uh, imperative that they provide this notice to, to teachers. So, uh, we, we believe that was part of the issue uh, with, with the last round, essentially, that there weren't. And, and, I, and, and the argument in, in, in response to that as well was, uh, I pay a lot of money in homeowner's insurance and automobile coverage, but do I expect to file a claim every year for the amount of the premium that I pay? That's an absolutely absurd argument. Um, and so the, another, another thing that we did was we gave our Department of Financial Services the role and responsibility of deciding, is it, more, is it, is it better for the state of Florida to open this up for, for, uh, for bid uh, or, or, or should we self-insure? And we actually found out from our prior experience that it was more, uh, uh, in my opinion, I think ultimately what we'll decide is that it's better for the state of Florida to self-insure. I think we can do that much more effectively, uh, cost-effectively. So let me see if there's anything else that... Uh, was kind of directed to address. Um, I think that's about it. I would I would say that um, no good deed goes goes uh, unpunished. So I, I do have a challenger, and uh, as as a result of this bill, and uh, and she happens to be uh, a member of the uh, the union board. So um, so needless to say, I I uh, think I wrestled uh, or ruffled a few feathers, and but but I'm. I'm not uh, not ashamed of it. I'm not sorry that I did it uh, because it was the right thing, right thing to do. And um, so, I'd love to, to have an opportunity to talk to any of you if you have an interest in doing something like like this. Uh, I think it's a good policy, and um, I think it's a good thing for, for for teachers. And we don't want teachers joining a union solely because they feel like they have the benefit of uh, the professional liability coverage. Um, like I said, if they want to join the union, that's, that's it's fine. It's up to them. This is America. But I think as a state and uh, states across the country, we have a responsibility to provide uh, them the coverage so that they know if they're ever sued um, that they can have that peace of mind knowing that they're covered. I'm going to stand if you don't mind so I'm not looking at the podium. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is really an honor, first of all, to back clean up, and second of all, to sit with people who have legislated uh, union laws and policies for the betterment of teachers. Um, it's really exciting how far we've come, considering that probably just about 10 years ago, all you would ever hear is, I can't, I have a union. How many of you have said that in your states? Oh, gosh, I've got a union, it's really hard. Right? I heard it last night, I've heard it today. You know, I really would love to do that, but you know, we have this union. My, and you all say, my union's the worst. All right, how many of you, my, you've not been in my state, my union's the worst. No, they're all 
really difficult when it comes to reforms. So to kind of pull it full circle to what Lindsay started out by talking about, which was the notion of school choice and change in dynamic for the kids, the kind of theories and practices we've just heard before in the plenary session, how do you do those things if there's this captive, um, this captive control, if you will, over our professionals? And so I applaud you, Ross, for talking about professionals, and I think that's what you need to run your campaign on, but we can talk about your campaign later. Um, so the biggest impediment is always unions. It makes all things possible. My task, very briefly, and I know you guys want to get to Q&A, is really talk about kind of where we are beyond these states uh, and the great strides we've made in states that have given us um, a new lease on life, if you will, um, from California with a, with a uh, case headed to the Supreme Court and accepted there, which is just extraordinary. Again, think about this. I mean, reform has been alive maybe Real reform, lots of places, 43 charter laws, 14 states with various school choice you know, programs, and more on the horizon for 10, 15 years, and we have a US Supreme Court decision in the offing. So the Friedrichs case, Rebecca Friedrichs, many of you know this. If you don't, Google it, it's a fantastic story. Reason TV has a great um, video of her talking about a professional. I, I wanted to be in the classroom. I didn't want to have to pay these dues. I questioned it. Um, and I asked questions and I didn't get anything but, you know, you have to pay, you have to pay something. If you don't want to join, you have to pay agency shop. So really the entire case is about agency shop. And the courts went back and forth, back and forth, and finally um, the California court found that, um, in fact, uh, it shouldn't be a constitutional right uh, for you to have, um, to, to uh, be represented by the union. So it's going to the Supreme Court, and we can only hope and pray that they'll rule in favor of these teachers. This is going to open up the floodgates. So, um, and, and just, to, just to, in the same way that many people thought that Wisconsin was the death knell for any legislator or governor who actually tackled the union and were proven wrong when Scott Walker was not recalled and when these policies stayed in place, uh, you now have teachers who voluntarily in the state of Wisconsin are withdrawing um, their membership. So just in the last um, employee member, uh, union membership dropped significantly, 68,000 in 2011 to 28,000 in February 2012, okay? Loss of 16,000 members, $2.5 million. I mean, the facts are astounding. I had pages and pages I was going to do, so I'm just kind of scanning through to kind of pr pr present these to you. But given the opportunity to make a choice, what happens, right? We make a choice that supports us. Maybe it's to join a union. Maybe it's to buy professional services someplace else. Maybe it's to say, I don't want to pay that. Um, and the exercise of that free speech, which I do think and hope that uh, the Supreme Court will find, is really extraordinary. Michigan also uh, did almost identically the same thing. And, um, and finally, Indiana um, had a huge gain when they changed to requiring a written authorization for the deduction of any kind of dues or agency fees. There's been a little bit of a rollback recently. I think they're going to come back, I don't know, Lindsay, if you'd agree, and, um, and make that stronger. But those are three huge union labor states. And those teachers aren't saying, we don't like you people because you did that. In fact, they're saying, wow, there's everywhere between $800 and $1,000 back in our pocketbook. And, and so this notion that we can say to people, whatever you have in your, in, your, in your arsenal of education reform, you can do it, and these are examples, and the union's often a very big paper tiger because at the end of the day, they're arguing to control what's happening in the classroom. So people will say to me, well, really, Jeannie, I mean, you know, look, I'm for choice and everything else, but you have to agree. I mean, after all, at the end of the day, really, they're just, they're just working on behalf of teachers, right? And I've heard a lot of good friends and legislators who will remain nameless say, you know, we're just, we really want to get in there and help them, and we don't really want to fight the union. Did you hear this argument when you were talking and trying to get support? I think you did, I remember hearing about that. Um, and so I just, I went, I pulled the New Jersey, the New Jersey put out a big um, uh, collective bargaining uh, toolkit to their uh, unions across the state just to make sure that everybody, all the districts knew and all the unions knew exactly what they could bargain for. The list is about five pages long of the mandatory topics you're supposed to bargain for and those that you're not allowed to bargain for is about a half a page. Okay, but it's everything from after school teacher only workshops. Um, compensation, of course, we know in all forms. Duty free lunch, 
um, number of evaluations above the minimum set by state rules and regulations, extracurricular assignments, right, dismissals, holidays. I mean, things that actually focus on every single aspect of a principal and a leader being able to be a leader and control the school and set the tone and set the hiring and firing and retention for people is actually still controlled by a few backroom conversations, okay, in most state legislatures. And so the extraordinary change, not just for more right to work states, but the whittling down of being able to say, as the Indiana laws say, you can bargain, but you have to do it on compensation. That's what Michigan says. You can bargain, it's gotta be on compensation, base compensation issues. Uh, Wisconsin, same thing. It can't be on when the school day opens and closes. It can't be on curricular. It can't be you can't go in the cafeteria from 12 to 1 when the kids are in there, and that's a violation of your contract if you see a fight going on, which is in most union contracts. It has to be at least around the teacher piece. And if you should decide that you don't want to pay those agency shops fees, you have a right not to. Extraordinary progress. I have a young woman that I know uh, who was in Teach for America with my oldest son. And she was in Massachusetts, and she was finishing out her, um, her time in a traditional public school in, uh, in R River Falls, or, or Falls River. And um, she got a letter saying that she hadn't paid her dues. So she immediately sends me a note and says, what should I do? I don't want to pay my dues. It's $661. Um, it was actually, she was already in, halfway through her second year of TFA. I said, write a letter. I said, write a letter and cite the code that says that you have, a, that you have an option. And I, she said, well, there's not that in the code. I said, I don't care. Write it anyway. So she wrote a letter and she said, according to Massachusetts Code 10240, I have a right not to be in the union. So they wrote her back and they said, you're right, Ms. Dosky, you do have a right not to be in the union, which I love that they said that, but by the way, you have to pay an agency shop fee and here's our contract and all the great things we're doing for you. So they ping pong went back and forth, back and forth in a letter and finally, literally they got to June 22nd, four days before the end of school and, uh, and she gets this note saying, um, we've deducted from your paycheck $661. And um, because it's mandatory and good luck to you and we're so sorry you didn't join the union. So I said, write them back again. Write them back and tell them they have now violated because you did not give them permission and as of now you are no longer a permanent employee and you'll be moving on because she was moving on actually to a charter school. She did, she called three weeks later, they actually redeposited the money. She challenged them. They have no idea what code she, she by the way, okay, no idea what code she cited. Now, I'm sorry that I gave her a lot of untoward, kind of crazy advice, but I was just checking out whether or not they would take her to task. Jim's looking at me, I know, I did that. And so, like, the reality is also, these folks at the local level, and this is really important, I, and I would recommend every state legislator or person who works in and around a state in advocacy, I thought I knew this stuff cold because I've worked on it so long, I literally started filing through all of the different bills and laws that have been passed, and I was astonished to see what our people did, right? And I'm astonished to see every day how much is going into this stuff. You guys have got to know this just as well as you know your data, just as well as you know the laws you write, read it, understand it. At the same time, you will be amazed how many people arguing these issues and defending the legislation, friend and foe, have no idea what your state says about the balance between collective bargaining, what's permitted in a contract, what's not, the time constraints for it, because every state has time constraints, okay? Who has the, dis the different discussions? Who has to be represented at the bargaining table is different in every single state. I mean, it is really amazing. So the NEA wants to present it as a one-size-fits-all, and at the end of the day, it is not. One-size-fits-all is there's a demand, um, but that's about it. And I wanna end with one, um, other little things, speaking of the NEA, let me pull it up here on my computer. So, um, what are they doing? Uh, April 2015, the NEA put out their agency fee toolkit, engaging members and leaders in a non-agency field world. A toolkit, I love this. Engaging members and leaders, I wish I had a slide, it probably wouldn't work anyway. Kids' hands, engaging our members in an agency fee world. Kids' hands, is just beautiful. It's all about kids. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, you know, and they go on and they basically tell you about fair share. It's a common sense way to protect equity, individual rights. We have no time to waste in our efforts to start contacting those covered by fair share and converting them into full members. And we must contact existing members to mobilize them in light of these attacks. The NEA has lost almost 300,000 members in the last two years alone because of just these few laws. 
okay, and the money that goes around with it. And their idea, with the checklist of what to do, what to do now, what you need to know about Harris Quinn is the other, is the Illinois case that Rahner uh, had the executive order also limiting collective bargaining rights and fair share. And um, it's probably moot because uh, the case will get to the Supreme Court before um, that's decided. But essentially, their big play right now is get to every teacher and make sure they understand why they have to become a full member before these things get decided, because at least at that point in time, they have you. The other piece of good news, um, so we'll read that toolkit, it's fascinating, so you'll know how to play um, against those things. Uh, and I'm sorry if there's anyone in the union in the, in the room, but it's a fair, it's a free world. Um, the final thing I'll say is youth is on our side. We've heard a lot about demographics. Matt did a uh, session earlier about it. Because we not only have a generation of new people and educators that are walking in the classroom that have never seen this movie before, right? They're just, I mean, maybe they were told they had to be the union. They probably showed up at their graduate school of education, or maybe they showed up in the cafeteria as they did to my young friend and started talking about joining the union. But they're kind of like, oh, I don't know. I mean, let me look on Instagram and see who else is doing it. I mean, this is a really good thing. All the things I really hate about my kids and technology, this is a wonderful world. They have so many options, so many choices, so we have to help educate them because they don't understand oftentimes what the potential is, but they are much more likely to question. We have a tremendous sea change in the number of people in the classroom who have been there uh, under 10 years versus used to be over 20 years. And right now, sort of the tide is on our side. So in a couple of years from now, or at least a year from now, I don't think any of us want to hear anymore, I'm sorry, I've just got such a strong union and they're really going to oppose me if I do this and I just can't do that big charter bill or change this or whatever because it doesn't fly anymore. It just doesn't cut it. Thank you. I feel like that eliminated half the questions. If they can't ask, I have a terrible union, what do I do? Um, but please, uh, there's a mic. If you have questions, we'd love to open it up to anyone. Just come on up. My name is Ginger Tinney. I'm the executive director for Professional Employment Educators, a non-union. I'm a conservative Republican. <laughs> okay. And now Terry Sloan in your state, Penn in your state, and Florida. My question is, how come you guys haven't attacked the juggler? That's collective bargaining. Because the laws you pass now also hurt the good guys that are running these independent organizations that actually do take the union members out of the union and give them a great alternative. Remember, core curriculum, you remember. Uh, she and I were on the battle at the state legislature this last year. That's so, a different session. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> and so I'm just saying uh, two things that would greatly help this movement. Go after collective bargaining like you have never done before. And go after higher ed that keeps us completely out and shoves it down their throat to join the union. So great question. What about the impact on non-union uh, agencies? Um, well, I'll just I'll just say quickly. We we uh, one of the things I didn't mention uh, within in the law that that we passed. It, it basically said that teacher preparation programs cannot re cannot include a requirement that they be a member of the union. And uh, so that was w one of the things that we we did this year. As far as the collective bargaining issue, that's something that we're looking at and and. Uh, in Florida, and maybe similar to some of the other states, the House is very, very conservative. The Senate is, is even though they're led by Republicans, they're, they're much more uh, uh, run-of-the-mill, kind of right down the center. And so it's uh, those, you have to kind of pick your battles. And, and with, the, um, with, with that issue, I think it would be a problem for us to get it through the Senate, to be frank, frank with you. Um, but I think as we move forward in the next few years, as the momentum continues to swing in that direction, we'll probably have the ability to do that. But I'm just trying to be very frank with you, and that's the reason why it's not been successful in the state of Florida. Any other thoughts on that, collective bargaining? I'll just add that I, when I was running my bill, I worked with a non-union uh, teachers association in Arkansas. Uh, they were very supportive of the bill and uh, were happy to work with me on it and, and didn't have any issues with it. Um, and for collective bargaining, it's my understanding in Arkansas at least that we only have collective bargaining in two school districts, uh, Little Rock and Fort Smith. Um, so collective bargaining hasn't been as much of a problem as in some of the other states. Uh, so it's not something we've had to deal with, but we also had an issue in, in Little Rock <coughs> schools where the state <coughs> government has taken over that school district, which has made, up, made it a lot tougher situation. 
Um, but that, that's a good issue. Yes, ma'am. I'm Christy Bassett. I am an art teacher, and I'm also the 2015 Florida Teacher of the Year. I want to thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for your work that you do to help lift the burden of the union off the teachers' backs. Um, and it is, it is appreciated. Um, and it is appreciated by teachers. And I want to definitely thank Representative Spano for his work in Florida. We, we really appreciate that bill. And um, let me know if you need any help for your next election. I'd be happy to endorse you. <laughs> um, so unions have unlimited access to contact um, teachers. Um, you're in inundated with emails and bulletin boards in, um, in the staff areas. Um, every time there is a pay increase, every um, improvement that may happen that somehow seems to benefit teachers or after every collective bargaining session, it's thank your union. And if you're not in the union, you're not helping the cause. So I, I agree with Ms. Allen that we do have to educate teachers, especially new teachers. But how do we get a message to teachers um, to promote professional independence and instructional individualism. Um, what, what can other teachers do? What can the people in this room do? And, and what ideas do you have? Great question, thank you. Well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have access, we, we should have access to the public records. Mm -hmm. uh, we can FOIA them, we can try to get them, but all that will get us is a name, right, attached mm -hmm. to something. We won't get that personal information, uh, although I will argue that they do that to charters all the time and demand that information. But you know, um, you know this, Christy, better than anybody, social media, teachers and mm -hmm. social media, they are on content pages all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you start thinking creatively about how many great free content, lesson planning, things that are sponsored by companies, by nonprofits that these teachers are on, it might be really interesting to conceive of uh, kind of a social media marketing campaign that could be organized to get, you know, get them to come back mm -hmm. um, because it really is extraordinary how cooperative and collaborative they are in looking towards other people for things. So I think whether that's in certain groups and states or just becomes really organic, I don't think we think smart enough about that. But the unions do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Any other thoughts? You know, I, I just think, uh, and, and merit pay is, is a difficult issue, but mm -hmm. awarding individuals exceptionalism mm -hmm. is, I think, a, 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 a start down that path. And it's always kind of burned me up that the worst teacher and the best teacher in the state I live in get paid the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so how we manage all that, I know, is, is a fairly complicated issue, but one of the things that w we want to address, and certainly now that I'm outside um, of the legislature and focused on specifically just education policy is, is ways that we can pay our great teachers more. Thank you. That's not a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Kevin Whitcoast. I'm uh, from a blue state, state of Connecticut. Uh, we are not a right to work state. And I think we need to approach things, change in our state uh, by working with the rank and file members of the union rather than attacking the union because I think if if this was broadcast to the populace of my state they would be up in arms that uh, a group of legislators are here to say how bad the unions are and how they're destroying uh, education if you will and the resistance to change when I believe that the teachers uh, want to embrace reform but we can't get that message to the teachers because we're only dealing and negotiating with the union leadership and I don't even think that the rank and file members see eye to eye with the union leadership. So I'm looking to see if you've had any experience about going directly to your rank and file membership and getting them from a grassroots perspective to get their leadership to change so we can actually have some reform changes in state policy. Great question. So bypassing union heads, any thoughts on that? Stump them. You know, uh, no, I, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate it, and I get it, and I thought about that, and I guess if I'd had 15 more minutes, I would have started out by, and I think we all would have talked about um, the importance of why we're talking about this is because we really believe in the power of teachers, right, to help dictate and control what happens in the classrooms and be able to rise and fall depending on that merit, and that's why these are problems. Like, that piece was not there. But when you talk about rank and file, what tends to happen is, I mean, every single teacher is, is scared to be talking to other people. 
So I don't know of anyone um, in the reform movement who hasn't gotten an anonymous call, an email that said, please don't use my name, saying, I really agree with you, but I can't say anything. So that's how a lot of us get great information and get into places, but we rarely get access. So I agree with you, there's a grassroots play here, depending on the state. Um, and if you can find a union steward turned charter leader turned secretary of education like Beth Purvis in Illinois who found her way through that, right? They're, they're, they are out there. Um, I just think it really depends. Just think too, real, real briefly, I, I'll go back to what I, what I mentioned in, in my portion. That is the messaging part of this is very important. And so um, we, we, we can't approach particularly in a state like yours. And in Florida, believe it or not, um, I, I couldn't approach the bill this year being aggressive toward the unions. Um, it wouldn't have worked. Um, so I approach it as, you know what, we appreciate every single teacher in the state of Florida. And, and, and you choose what you want to do, but, but we want to give you options, and we want to give you the choice, and we want to make it an environment where every teacher is appreciated, and that includes those who don't happen to have coverage. So, th so the issue is the messaging, I think, for, from our perspective, we probably have to be uh, cognizant of that and aware of that, certainly as legislators, um, because there is this this natural tendency to 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 create walls and there to be divisions when when we need to try and connect and develop common ground and figure out ways to you know um, and, and sometimes it's it's not always a good idea to be aggressive and so uh, I, I appreciate your point and and uh, so I think it, it depends on the state certainly and certainly in a state like Connecticut uh, your messaging is is critical. Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Heiner with the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. Thanks for the kudos to Indiana. Um, it's my home state and I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I'd just like to testify that what you said is all true. Uh, what we did in Indiana has helped tremendously. Uh, but we found in, in Indiana that a lot of teachers um, weren't aware of what was actually in their union contracts. Um, but then after some folks spent a lot of money and a lot of time, they were able to get access to some of the teacher contracts that, w that had been negotiated and found that, um, for example, if there were a couple teachers that were hired on the same day and they were the new ones, they were going to be riffed, then to decide who could stay and who was going to go, then it actually said in the union contract that you take the last four numbers in your social security number you add that together, and then whoever has either the higher or the lower number, then that's the person who gets fired. Okay, there are other contracts that will literally say, well, you flip a coin. Okay, when that information became public to teachers, well, that had an effect. Um, but that said, it took a lot of money, it took a lot of time just to get access to the documents and FOIA you know, is, is good or sometimes it's not so good. Um, but in addition to that, I'm finding that that's the case across the country. I'm also finding that, for example, the liability protection for teachers, that is a really big deal. In Indiana, our governor stepped forward and the attorney general said, well, the attorney general will represent teachers. Great. Took that issue completely off the table. But that doesn't work in a lot of other states where the, the, the <coughs> laws are just different. Um, so what I'm interested in, and I think what legislators really need to know is that, um, you know, we can tell them what other states have done successfully, but it's super intimidating for a legislator first to even know that first step to take to begin this process. Again, like, like the last speaker said, um, you know, immediately you get dumped on, oh, you're a union basher, oh, you're this, that, and the other thing. Um, so from, from the legislators, what's the first step, really, for people to take? Um, and especially in Indiana, we had, a, we had an army for a coalition, an army of supporters, greatly diverse. It just doesn't exist in all the states. So what's that first step to get that kind of information and to begin this process a legislator could take? You know, just, in, just informing them, social media is a wonderful tool, but um, the, you know, it, it's, every state's different. So it's hard to just give a blanket answer to that question. And so it really has to be on a state by state 
uh, basis in terms of, of how you reach out. And what's the most important issue at the time? There, it, it, it may be pay related, it may be um, work environment related. So, you know, there's, I don't know that there's a pat answer that I could give you. Uh, it just depends on, on the state and on the issues at the time. Well, besides taking the majority, what was your first step? Uh, well, I mean, we had introduced many of these reform bills over the course of at least eight years I served in the legislature. And like I said, they were, they were, they were dead on arrival. Um, and so when you have a sea change in a very short period of time like we had, we didn't let the dew settle on the flower. I mean, we <laughs> acted immediately. And, um, you know, so, you know, we, you, you have to determine if it's the right time and, and timing plays such an important role. I mean, but you can't be scared either. I mean, the, it's, it's not easy. It's money and resources and constituents. And um, so it's not for the faint of heart. You gotta have a lot of courage. Well, one thing I'd say, and I think this was a mistake I made when I ran my bill was my first step probably should have been to reach out to some of the Democrats and to see if there was a bipartisan support for my bill. I went in assuming that I would only get Republican support or Re Republican votes, and that ended up not being true. I had several Democrats um, vote for my bill, yeah, and I even had uh, my bill re-referred to a different committee because I was worried it was going to get voted down by Democrats. Uh, but you know, we had other issues. The biggest fight we had with the union in Arkansas during our session wasn't my bill; um, it was a Democrat's bill, and the the unions really clashed with the Democrat. He had a bill where uh, he was in a rural part of Arkansas in the Delta. Um, his wife was a superintendent of the schools, and they were competing with some charter schools like KIPP. So he had a bill that said, if you lose any students in your district to school choice, to charter schools or what have you, that school district can apply for all the same waivers as those charters. And I thought, wow, that's a brilliant idea. I mean, the concept being that if you're gonna have to compete with these charters and uh, private schools that have different options and flexibilities, why shouldn't we let the public schools compete on an equal playing field? Well, the union just went berserk, basically. Um, their fear was that, really their fear was, you're gonna use this to take away teacher protections and uh, you know, fair teacher dismissal. And so you had a lot of Democrats in you know, rural districts or inner cities, a, a really broad coalition who recognized that this was a great bill that could really, we're not even talking about choice here, we're talking about public schools and being, in, being able to help public schools and those public school students and the union still uh, really demagogued the issue and really went after this, this Democrat. And so I think your first step should be find your, find your allies. Don't assume that you don't have bipartisan support because I did. Uh, I worked with this Democrat on his bill. And uh, you know, going forward, I'll definitely, that would be my first step is to sort of reevaluate my misconceptions about who's on my side. I would just echo that 100% that you, you can't assume who your enemy is gonna be and I, I assumed that my enemy was on the other side, and I had some enemies on my own side. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so I think it's important that you, that you just do your due diligence, that you do your hard work, that you reach out to everybody in good faith, and you, 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 you try and win the argument, right? I mean, and, and uh, people will re really respect you if, you if you take an effort in good faith to explain to them, why is this good policy? Have you, really, have you asked the question in your mind as to why you oppose this? And if you really get into those into the weeds on some of these issues, you, you will find allies in places you never dreamed. And uh, so that, that's a very, very important point. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Steve Roberts, privileged to serve on the State Board of Education in Kansas. I'm in a uh, partisan political position. Uh, local school boards are nonpartisan in the Midwest, but there's a little politics where we are. A 10 member board. And I came in saying, um, in, uh, sworn in in January of 2013, that you don't have to go to teacher's college to be a great teacher. And I gave copies of Walter Cronkite's autobiography to my fellow board members because it tells the story of Fred Burney who taught him journalism, but he'd never been to teacher's college, but he had the gift. So that kind of planted some seeds. And we've done some good things in Kansas to invite professionals into the classroom um, without traditional routes to to the colleges of education. So my question to you is, is on my second initiative, which is a talking point. I wanna know what you think about it. I wanna know what you think the pitfalls may be. And it goes like this. Teaching is not union work. 
And I typically follow that up with my, my dad was a union carpenter. And I put myself through college as a member of SEIU, selling beer at the ballpark, Truman Sports Complex, which uh, alienates some of my Republican friends knowing that I was actually a member of SEIU. <laughs> but uh, it, it was great. It was a perfect job for a college student. And I'm, I'm not a union basher. I'll be accused of being a union basher. But I'd like to know if you have an opinion on the talking point that goes like this. Teaching is not union work. Okay. Provocative. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I'd like to know, I want you to provide me more substance on that because you sound like you've got a history behind that opinion. I want to hear what that is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my, first, I, I, my first degree was in engineering, uh, but I fell in love with the classroom. Uh, my kids were labeled exceptionally gifted, my daughter and my son, so I, 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 I rather loved this whole business of education. I said, someday I'm going to run for the state board and I'm going to fix a few things. And I knew I would be in Jefferson City. But I ended up moving to the Kansas side, and so now I work in Topeka. And I, I just know that we're so close to getting schools that work well for poor kids that uh, I, I think the momentum that I have now might be leveraged with my work at the Kickapoo Nation School. They, uh, we have one K-12 through Indian school in Kansas. They called me three weeks before school started, so I'm one of the bottom of the barrel dregs that they drug, you know, right before school starts, they have to fill a position. So if I'd have had a union there, I couldn't have negotiated a good salary. But I had negotiated a salary enough for me to go live in Powhatan, Kansas during the mm -hmm. week and come home to beautiful, idyllic Johnson County on the weekends. Mm. So when the liberal left says, you don't care about poor people, I'm going to say, excuse me, why don't you come to my Indian school, which is 100% free reduced lunch and all the rest. So, so the only thing I'd say about you know, teaching is not union work, is it assumes, it presumes people know what that means, and then you get the, but they support and defend, and you wouldn't have the kind of salaries if you had unions. So it goes back to almost something the gentleman from Connecticut was saying on messaging. Um, look, let's be really clear, no matter how we message this, I'm gonna contradict something I said to him. And in a way, I want to be sensitive to people who have a difficult legislature and don't want to feel like you're bashing. Sure. What is bashing about actually being factual, consistent, and clear? None of the strides that we just talked about here or in other states that have actually almost gotten rid of collective bargaining would have been made if there hadn't been people for two dozen or more years saying unions are a problem for teachers, for the classroom, and for the ability of people to reform education. Okay. Call it bashing, call it anything you want. It's true, right? So how much can we message and how much can we really just take the information if you're willing to say, look, the union's a problem because I couldn't have negotiated this kind of work that I just did in a great school. If it was there, then you're teaching. As long as we're teaching and educating and being factual, consistent, and clear, mm -hmm. I don't care, I don't think it matters how you say it. If, if I could follow up just very briefly, mm -hmm. uh, I happen to believe that, that unions are important to the building trades. And so that helps me with this talking point. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your feedback mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Do we have a few more minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, I'm Irvin Nelson. I'm from Nevada. I'm a legislator. And uh, I'm a freshman, uh, believe it or not, with all this gray hair. And uh, <laughs> I learned quite a few lessons this last time. One of the bills I, I sponsored was to make collective bargaining between governmental entities and unions optional. And uh, one of the things I learned was don't let somebody put a fiscal note on your bill and get it in assembly ways and means we'll, we'll die. So I won't do that again next time. But the, the, the question that kept coming up was, okay, if we get rid of collective bargaining, like I said, it was optional. The, the, the school board, the you know, county commission, they could, if they had the, the political will not to, you know, not to do collective bargaining, they could do it. It was not, we weren't forcing them to do it. The question kept coming up, well, then what will we do if we don't have collective bargaining? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do contracts with thousands and thousands of people and the model that we would cite to was, well, our state does not have collective bargaining. Well, state employees will do the same thing. So I'm curious if any of you have run into this issue. I want to reintroduce the bill if I get reelected and have a good answer to that. Great. Thank you. Thoughts? We don't have merit pay, so, oh, excuse me, not merit pay, but we don't have collective bargaining. Um, so it hadn't been an issue that we've had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Do you kind have of the same? Yeah, same. Yeah. I, I, it, I'll be, you know, I don't, I don't have any. Uh, ready solutions for you, um, but something I, I, uh, I recognize and see the issue and the problem that you've got is, is being able to 
cogently respond to that question, or what do we put in the place of what we, what well, we have? Well, so yeah. what do you well, do? Right to, right to work states have master contracts. So I heard a gentleman from North Carolina yesterday say we don't have a union, technically correct, but there's national, you know, but there's the education association that still encourages and, and facilitates the negotiation of a master contract, which for all intents and purposes has just about everything else in there. It's just not quite as tight and firm and it's not labor where it's not protected by labor laws. Mm -hmm. So a master contract can be negotiated between the superintendent and the leader of the local, you know, union. And, and what about the pay? Uh, education association. Even in your right to work state? Right. We're right to work also. But so, so what do you do in your states where you don't have collective bargaining? You have a separate contract with each teacher. Each teacher has his, his or her own salary, and it's different, or do you have they an have HR department that does everything? <coughs> Seniority. And they sign it with the local district uh, in our state. They sign it with the local district. So wherever they fall within their their seniority in terms of how long they've been in the profession, um, it what works that way. And then if there's a pay raise and the, the legislature appropriates the money for a pay raise to and it's blanket for all employees or all teachers. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, unlike the unions, we are all about content and not seat time, so we were wrapping up a few minutes early, but please join me in thanking our panelists. Very good.